Hi, my name is Isabella Hoffman. I uh, have developed a new technique for machine needle felting and I would like to introduce that to you. As you notice, I have a little bit of an accent. I am from Germany, I am from the Black Forest, and came to the United States, settled down, married, have, a ch have children and grandchildren now, and uh, developed that technique so that my grandchildren can use it as well as anybody else at any level of any talent. Um, so let's go ahead and I will introduce you what I have created. This is the pattern that we're going to work on. It is called Snow Removal by Experts. As you can see, those two are really having a lot of hard work to do. Uh, the fun part about this particular project is that it is, here's the little surprise, it is reversible. And there's not a single stitch to this piece. Everything is done by machine needle felting and shading and uh, you're going to have a super time with that. Uh, one of the things, because this, if this is your first project that you have done before, I recommend that you are purchasing uh, my beginner book that I have written uh, about all the techniques that I use in my machine needle felting that are really not available uh, at the moment to the public because it is rather new. The book, Willow Nook Machine Needle Felting Timeless Collection, um, has six patterns and in this book I'm introducing you to the different techniques that I have developed. Uh, at the beginning of the book I talk a little bit about the, the felting machines and the different types of machines that are available on the market. I will talk to you a little bit about the different types of wool and wool felts. <clears throat> we talk about the terminology, what is the front and the back of the various uh, um, felting techniques and uh, the fibers that are being pushed through. Here I will talk to you about the do's and the don'ts, creating holes and so on. And a little step further, we also talk a little bit about the different types of tools that you will need in order to create your artwork. And the shading techniques that I'm using and a little bit about the embroidery and embellishments that you would like to enhance. Throughout this book, you will find little tips sprinkled that will help you uh, to enhance your artwork and uh, will make the process a little bit easier. Also, each project has a project specific information that will let you know uh, a little bit more about uh, the different types of techniques that we're using and that you're also going to be learning. And again, these are just some of the projects that you can see. In the back of the book, you will have the pattern that you can then trace out and um, use in your in your projects. Uh, again, I would recommend that you buy this book first because of all the detail that is in there in my pattern for the one that we're using now that we're going to be doing, which is snow removal by the experts. In there, I will not explain all the little details that I have in the book, and I will assume that you do know what I'm speaking of when I'm saying using the press, using the punch side, and so on. So let's go ahead and let's get started on the project. We're now looking at uh, the pattern for snow removal by experts uh, by Isabella Hoffman. And I would like to show you real quickly in a short form uh, how this pattern is put together. Uh, the pattern is put together by step-by-step -step instruction with also pictures that show you each single step as we're going about creating this nice pattern, um, nice project. And you can see. So what I want to show you on the back right here, and then this goes through, it, the book is, all, the pattern is also um, uh, sprinkled with tips to make the process a little bit easier for you. And you might want to write these down and kind of start a little notebook so that you, as you continue with projects of your own, that you can refer back to them. This is the pattern section, and in the pattern section, uh, as, a, as you're paging through, everything is marked of how many you need to be cutting, what type of wool or wool fabric you need to be using. And I would like to start now showing you how I start the process creating the snow removal by experts. So let's go ahead. So now here we are in the, uh, in the pattern section and here are all the different types of patterns that we have to transfer onto freezer paper. Um, this will help you when you take the freezer paper and then iron it onto the wool. I use a simple freezer paper that you can buy by the rolls. I get them as cheap as I can get them. And you can take a piece right here and cut the pieces off. You can see there's a shiny side to it, which is the side that is going to be ironed onto the wool fabric. 
This is the side that is kind of dull and flat, the paper side. That is where you're going to do your drawing on it. For a little tip, uh, which you might want to put in your notebook, you can also simply, if you don't want to take the paper and you can see, I don't know if you can see really well on here, let's get a close shot on that, to show you that you can actually just follow the lines and you can draw out the piece that you would like to have uh, transferred onto the wall. But to make things simpler and much faster, you can also simply take the freezer paper and cut it into the size of a regular sheet of paper and print that into, lay this into your printer and print it out. It works really well on top loaded printers, not so well on printers that you have to slide it in from the bottom so that the paper doesn't get all kind of stuck in there. Um, anyway, make sure that also your printing is done on the smooth side, uh, on the flat side and not on the shiny side because that's the side that you're going to be printing, uh, iron the uh, pattern onto the wool. Okay, so let me go ahead and show you what I have done so far. Here I have transferred the pattern. Let me just show you. This is the face of the snow woman and I have just simply transferred it by hand onto the freezer paper. What I would like for you to see is that instead of cutting the piece very close to the edge, leave a little bit of uh, the freezer paper around the marked line. And the reason you do that, it's much easier when once you iron it onto the wool to cut along the black line and that way you're also not nicking it twice or cutting twice on the same line. That can become a little bit dangerous, especially if you have like uh, an area where you really need the detail of the edges. And if you cut into it and nick into it, it could be transferable onto the machine felted pieces and you'll see that. So here I already have transferred some of the pieces and as you can see again, the freezer paper is a little bit bigger than what I actually need. You don't need a whole big piece, but you do want to have a little bit so that you can now start cutting on the line as you want. So let me just show you how easy it is to iron um, the freezer paper right onto the wool. And you can see this is the wool right here and I'm going to iron it right onto it. Now it, it bonds. It, it's not going to fall off. It's, it's, it's bonding well together. So the next step here that I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and cut these pieces out. So I'm going to just rough cut out. So it'll be a little bit easier to work that way than if I'm taking a big old piece. So let me just move this to the side. Um, and you're going to cut right here on the edges. And now you're going to cut um, right here. And as you're cutting, I'm turning the piece, and that gives you a very smooth edge. There you go. What I'll recommend for you to do is that you keep the pieces of paper on there, the freezer paper, until you're actually ready to use the piece to be machine felted. The reason I do that is so that I'm not losing the pieces or that I, by mistake, end up having it reversed. And uh, especially in the snow drift and so on, you need to pay attention that you have it going in the right direction. That makes a difference because the snowman and the snowwoman and the shovels all sort of interlock. You've got to think of these pieces like puzzle pieces that you are putting back together. But we'll get to this at a later point and you can see exactly what I mean with that. Now I'm going to cut out the rest of the pieces. A very, very good idea. Another note for your notebook would be that you are transferring all the pieces that are white onto one sheet, all the pieces that are brown onto another uh, freezer paper sheet and so on and uh, collect them by the colors. And the reason you want to do that is so that if you are going to use a freezer paper, uh, a printer, you can um, print all these shapes out in one shot rather than having to go to the different pieces of freezer paper and figuring out which now, let's say, is this, this white, is this brown, and what color is that? Just kind of collect them all together. In the pattern, I don't do that because I like to show you in the pattern how I group the pieces back together like a puzzle piece. So it's kind of hard to uh, have all the white pieces in one shot and all the brown pieces on, on one piece of paper. So that is something that you can do ahead of time already if that works out. Otherwise, you will have to just 
get all the pieces that are white together. Like these pieces are all white. This is the snowwoman's body. This one here is the snowman's body and the shovel actually fits right in here. So as I'm doing this, you can go ahead already at home and cut these pieces out and again, keep the pieces all together, the paper pieces until we are ready to uh, place them and machine felt them. Here we have the different pieces that have been cut out. As you can see, there's still the face of paper onto it. And because I didn't have a paper long enough that I can print in my printer, I had to cut the snowflake, uh, snow drift in two pieces. Now, one of the first things you want to do is you want to find your center, and you also want to think of how far down you want to come off the edge or how far from the top you want to come down. You are going to incorporate here a fence, the snowman, the snowwoman, and you want to have a little bit of space up here for the skyline. Um, and also, if you want to frame the piece in on the edges, uh, you can either use a quarter inch seam allowance to add a piece onto it, or you can also simply later on, we're going to get to that part when we're going to embellish it, fold it over, machine fold it, and run a dowling to it. So that is the reason why you want to make sure how much space you want to leave in between here. And that's really up to each individual person. I do it like this so that if I want to do a little bit of a, I can also turn it like that, a dowling to it, I have a little bit of space for the picture. Okay, so now that we placed the snow drift, you can see right here this end of that snow drift is a little narrower than this piece right here. And that's why I'm saying it's very important that you realize what side that you are laying down so that you're not laying it down like this. And that's also the reason why you keep your paper on until you're ready to machine felt. Well, we're getting ready to machine felt this, so I'm going to peel uh, this piece of paper off. And you can see that really, really sticks well. And save these pieces because you can use them again, and then that way you don't have to cut that again. But for the first piece, I like to, like I said, uh, cut them a little bit bigger out at the beginning and then cut them to size. And we'll do the second one also right away. Um, and at this stage, you will need some quilting pins to pin the pieces down so they don't move on you, move on you until you are ready to put them under the machine to be felted. So we're going to give it a little pin and a little pin too. And very lightly overlap this because one of the things that the machines like to do is as they're felting, it likes to pull this away. You can see this like it's just like if the machine go punching in, that's what they will do. They will pull this a little bit apart. So very lightly overlap these areas right here. We're just going to felt it. You cannot machine felt over the needles like you do in the sewing machines because that will break all your needles and that's going to get very expensive besides it can cause injuries also if there's little tiny needle um, parts pop in your eye that has already happened. See how it's already pulled? So let me correct this a little bit. There we go. And I will also hold it together when I machine felt it so that it looks like one piece. The next step we want to do from this point on, we're going to add a fence. I already measured out the piece. You can cut your pieces on your brown for your fence in really long strips and then cut them to the pieces as you need. And you can also make the fence as long as you want to. That is really up to you. This piece right here approximately measures about eight, eight inches. It can also be nine inches and whatever you like. It doesn't really matter. It, it, that's a personal preference. Very lightly, actually I'm going to flip this guy over this first po uh, post. My husband told me that's not a post, it is a picket. But what do I know? I'm really not a construction person. I just, it looks like a post, so we call it a post. Okay, so we have it laid down. And that is your first very thing establishing. At that point right here, I actually like to go ahead and machine felt, or t I call it tacking, tack down with the machine felt these areas right here. Then I can take these pins out and they don't have to be in your way. If you had a whole bunch of pieces right here laid down all pinned on it, you're going to notice that these pins are all going to be in your way and it's going to be a real mess to work with. So let's go ahead and machine felt and tack these pieces down and I'll show you what I mean with tacking. Here we are ready and we have the piece put underneath the felting machines. This particular felting machine is a baby lock. 
Uh, this is a 12 noodle a needle. That's quite a powerhouse. That thing really works very strongly. I would like to recommend you all felting machines because I think all of them are really good. Uh, you might want to look at your current uh, felting machine needle dealership, which is all the uh, sewing machine needle uh, sewing machine dealerships in your area, and ask them about the after sale support for needles when you can repurchase them if something happens to the machine that you can get the support of the repairs and so on. So check out the different types of machines. I've tried all sorts of them. I think they're all really well. Uh, Let's start out with here. The first thing I would like to do is take out this uh, pin so that I'm not going to felt over it. And instead of um, felting the whole thing solidly, I'm just going to lightly tap. This is a free motion. You have to do the pulling. The only thing that this machine knows is to go up and down. It doesn't do anything else. So I'm just going to pull. And the reason I'm doing to just lightly tack this is so that I have the opportunity to pull the pieces back off when I am done. So let me just show you. Look at this, how nicely this all sticks together. Nothing's moving. But if I made a mistake, let's say this post is placed the wrong way or it's crooked, you can just simply now take a look, just lift it up and replace it without any damage to any of the material. So that is the nice part. That's why we're saying tacking. We want to make sure that we just tack these areas so that we can play without all these pins in the way. It'll make the process a whole lot easier. I'm going to go along the snow drift and do a little bit of the snow drift. You can already see also, if you take a, we take a real close look, that we have these little puck marks in here, which is where the needles have pushed the fiber through to the other side. I'm just going to go a little bit along. You don't want to do the edges of it because we will need these edges to push the other posts or pickets, like my husband calls them, through. I'm going to make sure that's straight. They're going to be laying underneath it slightly. So now we're going to come to the centerpiece right here. I'm going to very lightly overlap them. You have this very nice finger guard that is going to prevent you from getting your fingers caught underneath all these needles. Here we go. And you can see this bonded really nicely together. And we're just kind of moving along here. We're just tacking it so that we can place it Later on, I'll move it and lift it if it's not straight like we would like to. We can replace it again. Just doing that. That's all we need to do for at this point. You can see how I have these ends open. And also in here, and that's just for me to tuck it down. Now the next step is to place the snowman, or you can also, the snow woman, and you can also place uh, the second post already. So let me show you how I'm doing that. So this piece right here is one continuous piece, so I slid this down here and I went, and I had, I went ahead and I cut that piece. And you can see you kind of want to match the edges of the post, although I tell you it's it's really kind of pretty if you do one shorter or one longer. That's really up to you. The excess can be cut off then down in here. Save all the little schnipples. I kind of space a little bit about that much, about a finger width of room. And slide it very so little underneath the snow drift. Okay, at that point I'm going to pin, just to kind of hold it in place until I get it underneath the felting machine. And now I'm going to place the snow woman's body. And you can see this is the snow woman's body right here. It has this elongated piece. And that piece actually fits right in here, as you can see. So again, we're going to peel that piece off now. We're ready. Save those little pieces. Get yourself a little plastic bag, Ziploc bag, and put all your pattern pieces in. You have a little residue back here, but that can be wiped off and you can reuse this piece. Here, I take it and I slide it also a little bit underneath it. I'm going to lift it a little bit. Just see, I'm doing this upside down, so I apologize if this looks kind of like clumsy. And that's really all you need. The reason I lay it underneath it is so that you don't end up with a gap in between the snow drift and the snowman or snow woman. If that does happen, do not worry about it because we're going to do shading anyway, and that will uh, bridge the gap that is here. Okay, at that point, I'm going ahead and I'm also going to machine felt or uh, tack these areas. So 
I don't have to deal with all these needles because they can get in the way. Your snow turf doesn't particularly have to be very straight. Uh, it just depends on where you are, I guess, in your backyard and a mountain or a little hill. Okay, we're going to go ahead and felt this. So I'm going to hold that snow trip a little bit over the snow. And the best way to do this, and we're going to come up to the needle, take out the needle, don't forget that. Remember, your felting needles are kind of expensive. They come out of England. I don't know if they are made in the United States. I don't think so. And I kind of, uh, one of the things I like doing is just I like um, starting from the center out so that I'm not creating pockets. I leave a little bit of the edge open because I might have to put a post underneath it. It, it all depends on how you start laying out your pieces. That will determine if you need four posts in the beginning of your fence or three. It depends on how wide you cut your posts. It all makes a big difference. So here we are. We have folded and tacked these little pieces. And you can see how lots of space is open yet. The next step from here would be to place the shovel. You can see that this piece right here has an angle cut. That was from this piece right here because this was a very long piece. Uh, sometimes I can cut them uh, 16. If you're going to cut uh, 8 inches long, you can cut 16 of these. That's about as many as you would need. And they're about, uh, they're a little bit more than a quarter. They're not quite a half an inch uh, wide. Um, I think if you even if you go in a quarter, that still makes a nice size fence. You don't have to be that wide as I am. Uh, I want to round off the edges right in here, so I'm just going to take the scissor and free cut those little edges. And I'm placing this post next to it because that really kind of helps me space if, if another one can fit in here or if I have to lift this one and replace it so that I have a nice even fence look. I'm going to slide this underneath here. This one is a bit shorter. Maybe I can drag it up a little bit and there we go. Okay. And then I'm going to take another fence piece. So here's another big long fence piece. I'm just going to cut it about the same length, maybe a little bit longer. Straight out longer, can always cut up more. And uh, oh, yeah, not bad. Okay, so this one could have been over a little bit, but we have a handmade fence. I'm not one of those persons that has to be 100% perfect. I like a little bit of differences in it. It makes life more interesting. Here we go. Looks like a musical fence. Look at this one. It's a little bit shorter. That's okay. We'll cut off that little bit in here. Now, there is actually going to be a shovel over that, but you will see in a little bit why we're going to do it that way. You're going to find it much easier. Again, we're going to pin. And I'm going to machine felt these pieces. Let's just lightly tack them. Go ahead and tack them. So we see we have all these pieces um, placed and a little bit tacked and they're very lightly to lift up. Now I'm going to place um, the shovel. I'm going to take that piece off and then put that in your pile of safe pieces. And you can see there's a little indentation in here, and this fits right here in an angle. And it's kind of interesting. You can have part of the snow drift going over, part of it under. It doesn't really matter. You just want it so that you don't have a gap. And you're going to ask yourself, well, why do I have all these pieces behind here and we're just laying on it? Well, one of the things that I want to do now is I want to show you here. I'm going to take one of my markers. Uh, the, I take um, the dark brown uh, E49 dark bark. And I'm going to just with the fine tip draw a line. And that's what I'm going to cut away from underneath it. The reason you want a lady so that you have the flow of the natural picture. If you would just lay it and cut it here, you might be too short and all that. This gives you a very natural. And because we lightly tacked it, it's very easy to get underneath the underneath the uh, piece and just lightly pull it out. I'm going to do the same thing in here. This is on an angle. Coming from upside down, so I apologize if it looks awkward. 
just remove that piece you really don't need it save these pieces because at the end of your fence you might just need one or small little pieces that you have to insert we're going to place this back in here by removing these pieces underneath it, that will give you the opportunity to make this piece reversible. If you would leave these pieces and you would machine felt it, on this side it would be okay. But on the other side, you would see the brown coming through the gray. And we want to avoid that. We want to make sure that you have one smooth looking picture. And by removing the underlying pieces, you are also not having that danger of having the other color running through your piece. Um, that's kind of important. And the other thing too is that I want to mention and a little note is that the felting needles only like to have so many layers that they can punch through otherwise you end up breaking the needles. They don't like for instance any seams or if you had like three four layers of this that's too hard for those needles. Now that this is felted maybe the next thing you want to do is just actually work on the snow woman first before we laying the vertical or horizontal um, uh, boards. And the reason why you need to know how far over you have to come with the first one. So let's go ahead and place um, the rest of the snow woman pieces and I'll show this to you now. Here I laid the pattern pieces down as they were cut out and actually what we're going to do is we're going to peel the freezer paper off. I'm going to just move all a little bit over so you can see what I'm doing. And we're putting the pieces back together like a puzzle piece. Let me take that little here. So I'm going to lightly angle that. And you're going to notice that you have this little tip over here because that part is where the collar of um, the snow woman's coat is being placed. Right here. Same thing over here. I'm going to peel off the snowman's face. You could at this point machine felt this tack this down so it's not moving because you have a lot of little pieces laying around. And the other thing I want to show you is, is that when you're peeling off the face, as you're peeling off, that's how you want to lay it out. You want to turn it. You don't want to turn it because then you're going to have a wrong direction of the pattern pieces and they all follow each other. You can even kind of move this little guy over here. That's kind of cute. Here we go. And this is the hat. And the hat, we're going to simply be slightly laid on an angle. There we go. Now we're going to go ahead and machine felt it and tack this into place because that will establish us the length that we need for the horizontal board. Now these pieces are machine felted, tacked down. You can see I still have lots and lots of room even here. You can tell that I have a machine felt because you don't see the little pock marks kind of just pointing you out and there's room in here. So we're going to take the next um, post and I'm going to lay it down. Actually I'm going to turn it a little bit. And here again, this is a personal preference. You can decide if you want to come further down. This will give you space for um, the garlands that we're going to create later on. You can come up higher. It all depends on what it is that you want to do. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to place it here. I like that the idea that I can see that one fence post is a little lower than the other. I like that Norman Rockwell kind of a homemade fence look. So here too, another idea. We can come out longer and the next one shorter or you can make them all the same. I'm going to cut it about here. And again, we're going to take the end and we're rounding it softly. Because you have machine felted these pieces and you only lightly tacked it, it is very easy to lift and slide this post vertical board under so I'm going to go over so we are under it over so we're going to just lightly lift it up. If you would have machine felted that solid you wouldn't be able to do this anymore. But this is really a cool trick that you might want to do with all your patterns that you're going to do. We're going to lay it here. Now the next one can be maybe here. Remember you're going to have a third one here. So you could even take your third piece they kind of laid like here or here we have these short pieces that we had cut earlier. Your biggest thing is to remember here we're on top 
that means here we will have to go under okay so you have that natural flow you're going to machine felt this and once you're machine felting that you're not going to see much of this over and under but the reason i'm teaching this right now is that when if i ever teach you how to weave a basket and machine felt that with different colors that will come in handy so it's like an added on feature that you're learning ahead of time and again i'm going to cut that about here maybe a little bit longer just for the fun of it i like the little indifferences because it just adds so much character to it and you can see right here i'm like lightly overlapping so i'm going to just take this piece and cut that so it has a natural flow in here let me turn this around that way sometimes so you can play with that a little bit I'm going to ever so lightly lay it underneath it. Now here we are, under, we are underneath it, so here we have to be on the top. I'm going to cut this on an angle of the scissor. You can lightly lift this. There we go. And then on the side right here, we can come from here. And you can see I'm over here. Cut this on an angle. And it'll blend nice over here and up top here. That would be under, this would be over, and this would be under. And then that will match the last part of the fence. We're going to go again here and cut it maybe here. So centering your snow drift in the middle will also give you the space on each side on the end, making sure that you're not too far over to one side. And it gives you room to add a border or fold it under or whatever it is that you want to do with this piece. At that point right here, I'm going to pin maybe some of these areas because right through here, it will it'll flop around on me. This isn't adhered at all. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tack this. Now that these pieces are tacked in place, I would like to show you what the back already has done for us. You can see all these pieces are open yet. I've done a little bit more, so let me show you the back as I'm pulling it over. And you can see that um, the coat from the snow woman in the front is already trying to press through. So this is called the pressed side. And then the other side that we actually machine felted on is called the punch side. You can see right here is more. And you can also see right here where I haven't done any machine felting at all, just lightly tacked it. Um, and this is going to be filled in later on completely like here so that we can get the images on both sides. And here's a very good sample where you can see why we had to cut away the fence posts underneath it or it would have been come down. We have a little bit of a leftover fiber from the brown here as we were tacking it but that's going to disappear as soon as i start punching uh, the solid gray through here and you'll see it it's it's it really is a lot of fun to do that so at this point we are ready now to put the middle section of the fence in and before we do this i think we should be placing the snowman's body first because that will help you again the spacing for the fence so here's the piece for the snowman and i have this little notched out area and this will be where the shovel of the snowman actually will fit right in here and you can see it's lightly overlapping so that we have a nice uh, bond so let's move this piece of paper out of the way Save that again. The same thing we're going to do with the shovel. And uh, on your freezer paper pattern, you should have little notches that shows where this goes in. The trick part about this here is when you're laying the shovel, that sometimes you might have to turn it lightly towards your right. I'm looking upside down here, so we're going to slightly put this under here. And this too, this can sit right above it. Uh, the nice part is you wouldn't have to cut away underneath it. This can be over. This is the snow drift. We like over and under and so on. That's perfectly fine. Uh, we just don't want to have a gap like this in here. So we can have to manipulate it a little bit. You can do it under, you can do it over. It doesn't really matter. And now you can see it's 
nicely coming together. And we're just a little bit over, but that little bit isn't going to matter, even on the other side. You can see this little gap right here, so I'm going to push this just a little bit more. Here we go. By having this now, this will give me the spacing of how many posts I can lay in here. So I'm going to take a big piece of that again. If you have a smaller piece that would be long enough, use that instead. And you could do a second piece so that it'll help you to be straight across to kind of just kind of give you an idea how far up you would have to go. So about to here, I'm going to take my scissor and I'm going to maybe just clip it a little bit higher and round off these edges. And we're going to lay the first post right here. Now you can see there's actually another post that could fit in here, but because the snow woman is high enough, we wouldn't have to put a little post. You could, if you wanted to, add a little tiny piece, maybe about that big, round off that edge and add this in it so it looks like a natural flow of the fence. Or if you're lazy like I am, you just don't worry about it. So the next piece can go in here. And then we're gonna lay another one in here. So in here, I think for the spacing that I have over here and here, I really can only put three fences in there, three posts in there. Some patterns you might find that you have room for four, but that all will depend on how far or how close, for instance, your spacing would be. And so you can see here it could be four. If you're further apart like I am, in this case, I think three looks a little bit more natural. So that is sort of by the eye. Again, I'm going to kind of clip it. I have extra room down in here if I need to move it up and down. We're going to cut again these ends off. Cut this end right here. By the way, the wool that I get, I get these from Wooly Lady and uh, also from Primitive Gatherings. Or I go to Goodwill, I find an old coat like I did here. And you never know what you're getting out of it. You just want to be careful uh, what kind of wool that you're buying, that it is either 100% wool, and if it's 80-20, uh, you want to make sure that your iron is set at a lower temperature, otherwise you'll have all the good stuff sitting on your iron, and you get to clean the iron, because it kind of melts to it. Okay, now that we have these pieces right here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and felt these, or tack them down so that I don't have to deal with all the pins. So just like in the first part of the snow woman, we had laid down the fence, the, the verti um, vertical posts first before we did the horizontal ones, and then we went to the snow uh, woman's uh, coat and so on, and we're going to do the same thing with the snowman, so we're going to move his, his scarf, we're going to move the face. And we're also going to move his hat. And here you can decide if you want them to look all in the same direction, or maybe if you want uh, the face to look here. So we're gonna. So I'm slightly turning it towards her. I think they should look at each other. And then you angle the head this way instead of that way because that kind of emphasizes the fact that they're looking at each other. Because I think they're really fun. Okay, at this point, I'm not going to worry about cutting this away underneath it because this piece right here is quite a bit darker than um, the post itself. And you will notice that on the other side, it's going to punch right through it. And the same thing with um, the snow part right here. You really wouldn't have to cut away underneath it. It is dark enough that the color of the fiber from here will punch right through the white and through the background, and that's the nice part. So again, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tack these pieces down. So now that this is machine felted and tacked down, I want to show you how um, the dark color and fiber of the scarf has come through the back crest side. So I'm going to show you right here. See how nicely this is punching right through here? I haven't punched solidly yet because then you would find, you would see it right like this. It would look like that or like this over here. But that is going to happen towards the end when everything is placed. So let's go back and place the rest of the fence. 
I'm ready to put the posts in at this point. Oops. Here we go. And again, I'm kind of laying it over here so that I have the natural flow of the board. I'm going to lay it right here. And now I know how far over I need to go. And my next one would be laying here. And I have a little space in here. But I'm not even so much going to worry about that because I can actually color that in with my markers. So unless you want to actually put a piece in it, you can. And I'm going to cut that on an angle. There we go. And you could put piece in here if you want to so just to show you that you can piece these things it's okay let's see it has to kind of go in like that this is gonna fit right in there like this I should cut it a little bit shorter and if you like I am I like talking between my works so oh, maybe I'll try it like this I'll try it like that Okay, same thing over here. We're going to place it here. I'm turning this, as you can see, because it fits right in with that belly so nicely. Keep it a little too sharp. And again, I'm going to do the weaving part of that. Now, here I am on top. If I would have another post, it would be under. And I would be on top of here. So I'm going to top here. I'm going to lightly lift this area because we just lightly machine felted this. And this is going to be on top. And the same thing, this is going to be under. Lightly lift it. See now, I love this part that I don't have to deal with all these needles. They are such a pain in the elbow. Okay, this is going to be on top. And this is going to be lightly under. Now, depending on how you start over there, you might end up here being underneath it instead of in the top. So that is all how you start out. And then here, we would have to be on top. And we're going to be here under. Now, like this, I can do all of this without all these pins in my way. I love it. Okay, ready to place these pieces and tack them down. All right, now that this is also tacked down, and again, just very lightly, we can place the bucket. Now the idea with the bucket was, um, there was sort of a hind side thingy late thing, is you could fill this here with either um, little pom-poms that you can buy at Michael's and you will probably find these on a string in the upholstery department. I have found them there or Joan Fabrics. Wherever you can find little pom-poms, you can sew, sew them on so they look like little snowballs. Or if you felt that you can do like black buttons like the cold that would be in here. So if they're shoveling snow for five cents, it would be instead of five cents, five colds or five snowballs or something like this, something silly. Um, the next thing I'm also going to do is I'm going to place the sign. And that is going to be about here. Now you could move it over a little bit and then that way you don't have to deal with this post right here to cut away. And you can see right underneath it we're going to be cutting these pieces away like we did over here with the shovel. Um, I'm going to go ahead and slightly lift these areas. Yeah, I felt it a little bit harder, I can tell. And come over here and remove that. And we can probably do the same right here, about the same height. I can kind of eye this and pull this a little bit. And place this right in here. We've been, I'm going to do the same thing with um, the little bucket or basket down in here. I kind of can see this is where I'm going to have to kind of lift this area up. And I can remove this piece. And let me just place this back down. 
this is sort of on it. You can also, if you're not certain where to cut, simply take your marker and mark the area so that you know this is where you're going to need. That's where the cutting has to be done. And remove that and place this in place. Again, go ahead and tack these pieces down so that you don't have to deal with the pins. Now uh, that we have uh, folded and tacked these pieces down, we're going to establish the fence on this side right here. And here we're going to come as far over as we can. You see you have this little spot right here, so planes simply just cut maybe the fence on an angle. There we go. And then you can hug it nicer into that area. Um, again, depending upon how you started your fence, you might be further over, over or whatever. It all depends on how you want your... My, my post right here, there could probably be a post right in here. I wouldn't see much of this, so what I'm going to show you how you can tweak this so it looks naturally part of it. I might add a little piece right in here in brown to make it more flowing. Again, I can take this big piece right here, lay it down, so I kind of know how high I want to be with it. So I want to cut it maybe about here. And we're going to take the ends, clip that, lay it back down. Then we'll do the next one. I have about a finger split with space, so I'm going to probably be right here which just looks like I'm right in the middle of this. I try to usually avoid that if I can, but in this particular case, I won't be able to. So, but I'll show you in a minute what we're going to do next. About here. Cut off this corner. Throw that away. You can kind of eye how much space you can see. I have a little less here than here. I mean, it all adds to the charm. And this piece can be about here. And this very end piece can be about here. Or you can, yeah, maybe like this. Round up the edges. Round up the edges. Here we go. And don't forget to drink something in between and take a little break. When I start working, usually I'm like, I don't quit. I play till I fall over like a ferret. Okay. This one looks a little bit pointy. You could take these ends right here and make them pointy or make it look like they have a post on it, like a little one, a little other things. The other thing that you can do too, that was sort of a hind thought, is if you like birdhouses, uh, add another really long post and add like a birdhouse to it that you can sometimes find they look like buttons or they're made out of wood and flat. I mean, there's so many dimensions that you can add on to it. It's just a little kind of idea. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tack these pieces down so that I can start with the vertical, um, I'm sorry, the horizontal posts across. And then we're going to start, the next thing that we're going to start then would be the handles of the shovels. And there's a couple more tricks I want to show you that is really awesome. So I'm going ahead and I'm going to tack these pieces down. I'm going to add just a little piece for the flow of things. So just so it looks like. And because I'm too lazy, I don't want to really lay it next to it and have to go past all that. I'm going to pretend my post is going to be right here. So I'm going to take my scissor and I'm going to cut this here. So my post is actually looking like it's going to go behind the snowman. And I'm going to cut these ends off right here. I'll come on over here. And I'm going to place this piece right here. Maybe this way. This way would be better. There you go. I scoot it over a little bit. I'm in line. I'm sort of in line with the snowman. And then it, it doesn't look like I have such a big gap between each post. So I'm going to go ahead and felt that as well. Now we're getting ready. I have this little post right here to um, 
uh, shorten the distance between this post and that post optically. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to lay my horizontal boards. And again, I'm going to match this up. And here again, I want to decide how far over I want to get. I'm probably going to stop right here so that I have a little play for seam allowance if I want to border the piece in. I'm going to cut about here. The next piece, again, would have to come about here. And one can be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. It only adds to the character. And then over here, I really only need a small little piece. And instead of cutting that big piece, which I can use for something else, I'm going to use that little piece right here that I cut away from one of the posts earlier. I cut it a little bit on an angle, as you can see, so that it looks nice. So now, next step I have to watch out for is that I am going to do over and under weaving technique here. Over here, I am on the top. In this case, if the post would be showing, I would be under, and then here over, I'm going to be under. Again, just lift it up lightly. Maybe move this down just a little bit. And do the same thing right here. And I love the part that I can just slide it through and don't have to worry about pins. I mean, any shortcut I can find, believe me, I'm going to let you know. So this is going to be top, so I would say that this has to go under. Yes, you could cut that away, but it's much easier to just plain simply do that. Just like that under here. And you will see uh, the same technique in the pattern that I have prepared for you. I tried to take as many pictures as I could, so that at moment, any moment you can stop and look at it again and review so we hear under, over, this piece has to be under, and I can see I didn't cut the end, so let's do that. Under. Make sure that I'm about the same here, approximately. And if you're not certain, kind of lay your extra piece that you have left over or a ruler. Okay, I'm going, I'm going ahead and I'm going to felt and tack this piece down also. Now that we have all the pieces placed and uh, lightly tacked, we're now ready to place um, the handles of the shovels. And again, to, uh, you want to cut away the pieces that are underneath it. Uh, this shovel right here is square. I like my shovels rounded like my posts, so I'm going to go do that. And you can also shorten them. They don't have to be that long if you only long, want to be maybe that long. Oh, let's do this one right here. I'm going to cut him here. Lightly lift it and slide it underneath here. And I'm trying to angle it so that I don't have to cut through all these pieces here. I'm going to take my marker and kind of maybe and go a little bit underneath it. You don't want to be right next to it, maybe rather go a little bit underneath it so that you're not cutting away too much of the piece. So it tells me right here. And I'm going to cut. I can lift this. And you can also see right here. That away. This is much easier doing it that way than if you're cutting it before and then pasting the pieces back on it out of the simple reason you're going to lose the flow of things. And I like to cut them a little bit clo um, uh, closer together so that I'm not having pieces that are too far apart. So here we go. And then this piece is going to be machine folded and we're going to do the same thing on the snowwoman's shovel. I'm going to shorten this so I don't have to actually cut this piece. Anything I can make easy on myself. Lay right to here and I'm going to cut it about here. Lift that shovel because it's only been lightly felted. Take my marker. 
go a little bit underneath it so you don't want to come right next to it but actually take your pen and slide it underneath and then that way you know you're not cutting the pieces too far apart let's take a peek about like that you can actually slide it This piece. And you can see I need to do a little bit more here. Oh, come here. If you had this tiny little gap, that's okay. We can fill that in with um, the marker, the colors, whatever we kind of miss, we fill that in. So you don't have to sit there and put a little piece in there. That would be way too much work. We're just simply going to color it in. Little artist trick. Or just really lightly overlap it. Here we go. Um, crooked, but I kind of like it. Here we go. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tack this down also. All the pieces are felted uh, and tacked into place and I want to show you what the back looks like before I'm going to completely machine felt everything solidly through so that you can see both sides. So as I'm turning it, oh, we have all these little bits and pieces here. You can see the areas that have not been machine felted like in the snow woman, the face. Some of the fences are not showing really well through. But now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to finish it and periodically we'll check the back to see if the pressed side has come through nicely like for instance in these spots right here or here. You can see how nice solidly that is or even like here. That's the look that we're looking for. Okay, so your job and my job is now to finish machine felding and checking it and we'll get back together for the shading. All the pieces are, are now machine felted solidly and uh, I'm going to turn this over so you can kind of see, you can see how the image is on the other side also. And you can also see some spots that could use a little bit more machine felting, for instance also like here and here. But I'm not so much worried about these areas because this is the opposite side. But this is the press side and some of these pieces can also look like the snow has kind of stuck to the posts and to the boards and like in here you have snow stuck to the head and snow stuck to the shovel and I want to show you something with a little trick when you have machine felded your shovels right here and you have these solid colors when you come from this side and you punch from the press side to your front then what you can do is, is this um, fiber, the background fiber, will come to the front and it will look like you have snow stuck to your shovel. This is a little trick that I discovered when I went back over it by mistake. And um, use that to enhance this area right here. And you can try this out yourself. Uh, first, uh, machine felt this solidly to the back and then come back again and machine felt from the side and you will receive the look of snow right in here. Um, just an added feature to it. I am now ready at this point to go ahead and do the shading on both sides and I think I will start on the side that I actually did the machine felting, uh, the punching on and um, I'm going to lay out all the markers and show you how I'm going to start. Um, this is the finished piece, uh, the first one that I'm showing you how, what we're going to do. And we're now going to start adding the shading in here. Uh, we're going to add the dots. We're also going to shade the fence a little bit. We're going to add the face. Uh, we're going to add the garland and that's all going to be drawn in. And we're also going to repeat the same thing on the back. And you can see that this has a much more muted, softer look. And it really is up to you what side you like best. And most people, because they're having a hard time, they don't know what side they want to show. They simply 
uh, turn the edges over, put a doweling on it, and hang it up on a window so they can see both sides. But again, you can turn this into a pillow, you can put this on a bag, you can uh, do this for a cover. These pieces, uh, the finishing part is all left up to you. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll start doing the coloring on the piece that we just have machine felted. Um, you will see on your pattern pieces that you have drawn out, for instance, like on the snowman, I have a line right here. And this line just helps separate the two big ball snowballs that created that snowman. The color that I'm using for that is a warm gray, which is called W7 Warm Gray from Copic Markers. And I plain simply just going to draw a line in here. And uh, this is the fine tip. They have two different tips. This is the wider part of the tip, and I'm simply going to stroke it down. I used a warm gray rather than a cool gray because I find the cool gray has a little bit too much blue in it. With the blender, which is a colorless liquid that's in here, this one has been used, so the colors have been, the tip is kind of colored already. I plain simply take these hard strokes and soften them out. You can see right here how soft I can make this look. And already it kind of adds a little bit of a shading. Don't be afraid with that. I'm going to take the same white tip again and you can kind of see a little bit where the snow drift would be. You don't have to do everything, just do parts of it. This is just like a drawing. Maybe in here. And we're going to do come up in here a little bit very lightly. Again, the key to your drawing and to your shading is the blender because it softens everything. And sometimes you'll add up, pick up a little bit of fuzz, like you can just wipe that away. And you can see how strong this is right in here, so let's soften that a little. And that kind of gives the little separation line that shows you the different section of the belly. I want to add a little bit to the edges right in here and just very lightly, don't do a lot, but just maybe a little bit, and maybe just even a little bit in here. Just go ahead and play. Here you get the color like a four-year-old one. You're going to feel like you're going to be drawing and coloring by a line, and it's so much fun. You don't have to be afraid. If, you, if you're if you not certain how the colors are going to react, you might want to take a little scrap piece of the material that you have worked on and test out the colors first with the blender to see what the reactions are. I'm also going to add a little bit to the face right here. Now I'm making this upside down, which is a little bit tougher because I don't have the face right in front of me. I'm going to wait with the face a little bit. And I have a little bit of residue left on here, so I'm going to add this right on here. And here's another little trick. If you're not certain how much you want to add on, take your blender and add this right like that. And then that way, you're not having a full brunt color. You can see how I can change the look on that. Isn't that cool? Okay, make sure that you cover up the colors that you're not using because they are alcohol-based. They will dry out rather quickly. I'm going to go ahead next, and since I have done the snowman for you, I'm going to go ahead and I will start adding the colors into the fence. I'm going to pull this over a little bit, and I'm going to take the dog bark called E49. I love these colors. So you can add like two dots kind of like diagonal from each other to indicate these are the nails of the fence on the edges. This is what I do. You might want to just have one. I like to have two. And then we're going to put a dot in each. I think I'm going to need a new brown. You can hang on a second. I shall add a new brown. I'm 49. Mine ran out. Uh, cool thing about these markers is that you can purchase refills, and these refills are 
filling up your markers up to 10 to 12 times and simply what you have to do is just take that fat piece you can take these ends and you can pull them out and fill them up from there and they fill them up to 10 times that is where your savings comes in and, and you will like it the color that's most likely going to run up faster is your blender so you can see I added all these mark these dots in here and I'm going to do this throughout the whole piece right here. The next thing I want to show you is, is how I'm adding some shading techniques into the fence. Um, you can see where you have where you have been on top and where you have un been underneath it here on top I like to do a little bit of shadow right underneath here and maybe to help separate these areas right here and um, this is going to be here. Actually, this should be. This is on top. This is on. And after a while, when you machine folded this really well, you can't really tell the difference. This goes here. So actually, this should be over here. But even though I have the color, we can blend this out. Um, we're going to do a little bit here. Let me show you another little trick. You can take the white part of here and just really go with a hard stroke like that. Okay. This is over because this is under. And I'm going to take the blender and I'm going to blend these areas out and see how much softer this makes this whole look. And I wasn't here and I wasn't so sure. There we go. This one was really crooked. Look at that. Now if you come into stuff like here where you feel like this is crooked, take your little marker. Just kind of fill these areas in. Everything is allowed. We have all sorts of tricks we're using anything in order to help us achieve what we'd like to make it look like. Here we go. And you can already tell how much the fence has changed in appearance. Let me just add a little bit more here. And you can do as much as you like, as little as you like. You can come from the side in here and kind of add a little bit. There we go. this is over this is under I want to keep this part light and maybe I want to do a little bit on the edge right here mm -hmm. um, my husband is working downstairs and so ignore this pounding no it's not my foot because I'm impatient he's building something and uh, maybe in the next pattern, I will let you know what it is that he was building. <laughs> At least he's doing something, you know. Here we go. Now, you can already tell the difference from this to here. And you can even continue and add more shading to it. All depends upon what you want to do. So now I'm going to finish up the rest of this part, and we're going to get back to uh, the snowman and to the snowwoman. Now you can see we have finished the fence and we've done a little bit of shading on the snowman and on the snowwoman trying to find already our place where our buttons are going to be or our coals. And I want to show you now the next step is to do uh, the face of the snowwoman. This was the piece that I used for uh, cutting out the wool piece. And what I did is I simply went and I cut out the holes where the eyes are going to be and also uh, where I had the dotted line for the mouth. This will help me to place the face if you're not certain where the face is going to be. So I'm plain, sim plain simply is gonna, I'm gonna lay right here. And I'm gonna use the lightest color that I can find because if I don't like it, it's easier to blend that out than if I'm using a dark bark. So I'm gonna just put a little circle here, right here. And you can kind of like follow the mouth. So here we, I placed the eyes where I think they're going to be and also I drew in my nose. Now you could take, uh, the nose should be sort of sitting between the eyes. You can also make the nose as long as you want. You can curve it a little bit. It's all up to you. Try different pieces out, lay them down how you want it. You can cut them out of the wool felt or you simply can color it in if you feel like that's what you want to do. You can also cut a piece out of the uh, freezer paper and lay it down and see if you like it that way or color that freezer paper piece in and lay it down and see. So there's all sorts of options that can help you. Because I use this as a lighter color, I'm not going over with the E49. I hardly ever use black because I find that black is very, very strong. 
and again I'm gonna do this from upside down so I'm gonna go back over and correct it in here I simply add little dots for coal and I find that for a lady you might want to make smaller dots than big old coals and here I'm gonna leave this so that I can add and the colors to it once I take a closer look at it. You want to repeat that same technique on your snowman as I have shown. So this is the finished version of that right here. Um, I think what I'm going to do for myself, I'm going to color the nose in instead of using a wool felt piece. And I'm going to just simply color it in. And maybe I'll bend it just a little bit. It's just very friendly. And you know, sometimes these carrots have little tiny lines going right through. Um, uh, those are those little knees right here. There we go. A little shadow. Go very lightly with that because you can repeat it on the other side. You will notice that some of these colors are going to come out on the other side. Well, here we see very, very little of it. And that sometimes helps that you know right away to place it. But I usually try out with a light touch so that each side can be a little bit different rather than really trying to soak the material with the color. Um, you can also uh, use your um, a warm gray and you can go around the color of um, the snow woman and you can soften some of these looks or kind of pull it out a little bit more at that shadow down in here that is all the fun part let's use maybe a chocolate brown and we're going to emphasize her the edges of her coat I have to use a different one I keep grabbing the old one here there we go And it just kind of strengthens the edges, and you can already see the transformation of that. And if I want more coal, here we go. If I want this a little bit stronger, I can just add a little bit. It doesn't have to be a lot. A little bit, a little way goes a long way. And now I'm going to go over and I'm going to do the snowman and... I want you to repeat the same thing what I have done with the snow woman. As you can see, we finished up the snowman the same way that we did the snow woman. We added uh, a couple of uh, eyes to them, we added the mouth, the nose, and we actually just shaded it in rather than taking another piece of wool felt and punching it in. You can punch the wool felt and it'll come out on the other side just the same way and that we can maybe be more helpful for you for placing the eyes and the mouth so that's all a thing uh, use again the lightest color found that you have to practice on it and you can also practice on a piece of material first crap piece cut another face like this and practice on that first before you go ahead and place the face because um, this is sort of an important area right here uh, for the uh, sign Again, I'm going to use the E49, which is the dark bark, and I'm going to place a little dot right here. Now, I can make um, make it look like I have a wire running over the fence and coming around like that. There we go. And so it looks like this is what's holding the sign up. In here, again, take a piece of material and practice from the same thing how you want to write down snow removal by experts because if you don't start way over here you're going to have not enough room for removal because removal is quite a bit longer than snow remo uh, than just the word snow so that's a little bit of practice piece so that you can centering your letters so that you are not running out of space I have done it a couple of times so I'm just warning you um, at that point I want to go ahead and I want to show you how I'm doing the garland now all these these uh, techniques that I'm showing you in shading I would like for you to repeat on the other side so that you can make this piece reversible um, and a lot of people are afraid to go ahead and start making a garland think of a letter S when you're going to have when you're starting here um, actually I'm just going to kind of go backwards just simply take your dark bark and have your lines go over and under and above and under just go snake it through and don't be afraid to do that and it's going to come around and so we're going to continue and this is really a lot of fun you're going to love this piece okay and now not only do we have a garland but we sort of want to have a couple of branches coming off of it 
So you just place the prime just wherever you feel like it. Just curve everything a little bit. It makes look the things a little bit more interesting, the lines. And it also fills up the space. Let's just do a couple here. And maybe this one runs over that. Let's go a little bit more. Maybe a little bit from here. And and you can place it again. Place it, maybe this one right here comes around that way. Okay, so I think that's plenty of branches. And here's the fun part you're going to have. If you go, I'm going to place um, pine needles on these branches so that I look like I have a pine garland. So at the end, when you see the end of a branch, just simply drag a line and come off like a letter V and just keep going. Just and don't do really tiny ones, really kind of like go for it. Let it let it finish its own drawing. It just kind of like finishes by itself. And you can already see what it does. The only thing you need to make sure is the direction of the needles always go towards the end. So they don't go this way, they come that way. They come off the end of the branch. They don't go into the branch, they come off. Sort of like hair comes off from us. In nature, it is the same way. Now here, I'm going to come this way because the branch is going down. I'm following the branch. And you can already see the transformation of this piece. I just love doing that. Now go ahead and finish up the rest of it and we'll come back to you in just a minute. Now that we've finished the garland, here are some options that you can do. If you want it to be a little bit more festive, like towards Christmas, you can add your own little light bulbs and cut them out of the wool felt in the shape of a light bulb and add them in there. You can try to draw in some pine cones if you want, or maybe find some real ones that are kind of small that you can somehow sew in here. You can also find little snowflake buttons that you can sew on here, or better yet, some little seed beads or swastika crystals that you can buy at Michael's or go to one of your bead shops and you can add this all in there for added dimension. If you want to go a step further, you can even go ahead and start maybe embroidering the garland if that's what you want to do. But even so, if you're not doing any of these, this is a wonderful piece just like that. One last step that I'd like to show you is that you can do a little bit more shading with this particular shovel right here. I'm going to use the warm gray again because that's a nice color with here. And I'm just going to add a little bit of shattering right in here. And some of the sh uh, shovels have show the areas of where the handle kind of falls in place. So I'm going to go ahead and use the blender. The white tip of it usually works best and just kind of drag this and soften this out a little bit. And again, if you want a little bit of snow coming on this side right here, that snow got stuck to it, simply turn this piece over and machine felt on this side and so this piece will come out making it look like it's snow. That is pretty much as far as we're going to go in shading and so on and the piece at this point would be finished. What you would Now I'm going to turn it over. And I'm going to show you that you can repeat the same steps on the back, and that is what makes this piece reversible. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. It is lots to learn, lots to take in, and I'd be happy to listen to your comments if you want to write to me at baileycollectibles at hotmail.com and simply go on my website for www.isabellahoffman. Uh, all the information is on there, including the book that you can purchase for your information to get more details on my techniques. One last step that we wanna, I would like for you to know about is about the Copic Marcus, the product that I'm using. I've been using these for over 10 years on my mohair teddy bears for shading. They're very forgiving on wool background, especially on fiber. And mohair is a fiber, it's a hair. And so I want to show you that these markers are really, really awesome. One of the things is they have a three-year shelf life, and it tells you about it here. It tells you also that they're free of acids, that they are water um, proof, or um, you can wash your material with this. Uh, I would say it's going to take a couple of days 
to really make sure it's dry dry before you're going to go ahead and, and would wash something like this and most of the time I would not even just hand wash it I probably would bring it to a dry cleaner and tell them not to use any alcohol based products on them to clean this um, the nice part about Copic markers is that you can it comes in a variety size of packages you can have the really white tip for instance if I'm going to start working on um, forced grounds where I need a big piece or clouds or something like this. You can also purchase a refill so they can refill your markers. They come in, this is what the refills look like, they're called various inks. You can uh, change the tips when they wear out. This shows you how to refill the markers with the refills. These are the color combinations of sets that you can purchase. And right now, uh, in our area, in Milwaukee area, I know that you can purchase them at Artist and Display. And you can also go, um, Hobby Lobby might have them as well. I don't know if they carry the refills, but you can definitely check out on them or they can order them for you. Another set that you can purchase is called the Kayo. Kayo is the same thing as the markers that I'm using, but they're a little bit thinner and they have a different color combination. They're mainly more into the pastel colors, but I see they also carry the E49 and so on. So you can purchase these individual sets. Um, I don't know what they are in retail. This is something that you have to check out in your area. And if you maybe can get a coupon from um, uh, Hobby Lobby or sometimes Artist and Display also carries the coupons. They'll send it out to the customers if you put yourself on their email address. And you can purchase these then on a more better discount. Um, their uh, Kyo is about half the price. They also are half the size of these right here. But they use the same refills. Another step that they also do is, is that you can take your Copic markers, they have uh, here they offer an, an air can, which is probably about 10 minutes worth of air. You can take this attachment right here and screw that onto the air can and then take your markers, slide that into it and on the bottom right here you can actually airbrush. You can also buy a different airbrush system so that you can do the whole thing. It is really phenomenal what you can do. They have very thin, multi-thin liners for thin drawing. Um, basically they were designed for drawing and co uh, comic uh, um, uh, magazines and so on but uh, we have found out that you can use this more than one application for instance we have also some of the quilters use that for their backgrounds on calico uh, and on um, uh, cotton backgrounds uh, the technique is a little bit different but um, and it's not quite as forgiving as it is on wool fabrics but again, this is a really wonderful product. I know what they're doing. I recommend these for my artwork. And again, the fact that you can refill them and that is where your saving comes in, that's why I recommend these right here. You can use these refills up to 10 times before you have to um, refill them again. Uh, wishing you a nice day and hopefully a lot of fun with the products that I'm creating. And um, have a good time. Oh,